Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where I have finally returned from the land of San Francisco, where I was last week for the Data AI Summit 2022. Now, it was it was full on. There was lots and lots and lots of stuff to cover and a whole world of announcements. So we got so many things to talk about. I'll do a general recap of the actual session as another video. I'll do a recap of the day two announcements as another video. So for now, let's talk about day one. All the things that are announced, the key takeaways, what they mean, and yeah, what's why we're excited. And there's a lot, even for day one. There's a whole spree of new features, of new words, of project names that we kind of need to get our head around so we can go, this this is what's happening in the world. And there's way more than we're going to talk about. But I just want to focus on some of the key announcements from the day one keynote. Then at least we've set the benchmark about everything that's going on. As always, if you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. And yeah, say hello. Ask any questions. Let me know in the comments which of these various things we're going to talk about are your favorite feature. Which thing are you excited about? Let us know down below. Okay, right. Digging into it. So first things first, the event was free virtually. So if you didn't make it to any of the sessions last week, I believe you can still register and you can definitely still watch on demand. So even if you didn't manage to watch the keynote, I do recommend watching it, hearing it from the people themselves, all about what they've designed, why they built it, the market they're going for, all of that good stuff. Definitely listen to the day one keynote. Uh, and yeah, we'll talk about it. So I've skipped through various different parts of it uh, to kind of pull out some of the key announcements and we'll talk about what they mean. So up first was Reynolds in talking about a thing called Spark Connect. Now, this is... A a way of saying, you know, not everyone develops directly in Databricks Notebooks. Not everyone develops directly in Spark Notebooks, Jupyter Notebooks. Actually, what about those people who want to develop in a thin client? They want to develop in, as it shows, IntelliJ, PyCharm, or various other things. Definitely PyCharm. What about people who want to just have a local environment with a bit of Python running on it? What about people who just want to put it via an API? All those people kind of struggle to use Spark interactively. Um, and so they bring out a thing called Spark Connect, which is a thin client that will allow you to run Spark commands that will send those clients, uh, commands off to be run and bring it back, but allow you to do all, all the good things, all the interactive working that you would normally get if you're working through a notebook, but actually in your local environment. Now, you might be thinking this sounds a lot like DB Connect, because it is a lot like DB Connect. It's a different approach, different way of working. It's very, very much more Spark and Databricks. Um, and yeah, it looks like they're, they're tackling some of the main problems that people had with uh, DB Connect, which is that it was so integrated into uh, Databricks itself, it didn't quite work as people wanted it to. So this should actually be a better way of working. I've not had a chance to play with it yet, but if you're trying to write local Spark applications using uh, something like Databricks as the back end, then this is the thin client app you can do. And there's a, actually a very, very compelling demo of working with Spark on an iPad, which is interesting and weird and mad, but cool. So Spark Connect, intermediary thin client for working on top of Spark. Big announcement number one. Big announcement number two is Project Lightspeed. Now this is a essentially just saying they're looking at Spark structured, structured streaming and they're saying, you know what? It's a bit too slow. The fact that it's a micro batch processor and between every micro batch, it has to go, right, where was I? Cool, do a little bit of work, and then write down what they've finished doing. And lots of the things in terms of how um, Spark Switch streaming works, it's just a bit too slow for doing real good low latency streaming. So there's a big focus currently going on in terms of saying, how do we, one, streamline that process, to make all the various checkpointing things asynchronous so I can keep processing data without having to stop and lose my checkpointing whilst maintaining the same level of state management and consistency and restartability. That's what Project Lightspeed is. It is all looking at essentially how do you take structured streaming and make it much faster and reduce the intervals of your various different micro batches. So it looks like we're going to see lots of various different things, a bit of focus on the streaming elements going on just to make it faster, just to make it actually, if you are trying to do something that has to be really real time, then actually Spark is the answer. Because um, historically it's not. We do a lot of streaming in Spark. I love streaming in Spark. But if someone says, I need sub-second latency, it's like, well, that's, that's not Spark. 
because Spark runs as micro batches and it has to stop top and tail everything. You can't get that. This is what they're aiming for. They're aiming to make it actually a true first party streaming engine for any streaming applications, not just the ones that don't mind a little bit of micro batch latency in the mix. Again, super interesting. You'll hear more about Project Lightspeed. I think there's already some blogs out about what's inside of it. But that's not as interesting as Delta Lake 2.0, which is huge. So Delta has always been a tale of two Deltas. There's always been the open source Delta Lake and then Databricks Delta. And Databricks have talked about the Delta engine. They've talked about their various proprietary things. And it's always been really hard straddling that line going, oh yeah, just, just run Optimize. Oh wait, no, no, Optimize. Is Optimize, uh, we, is, uh, there's two flavors. And that was really difficult. I mean, Optimize is now in uh, the open source Delta Lake, but that's much of a muchness. There's always features that were just Databricks and then other features that had been open source that were part of the wider Delta Lake open source project. Delta Lake 2.2, 2.0, sorry, is saying that is all the same thing now. So Databricks are committing to everything that is fancy and proprietary. All of the optimizations that work on top of Delta inside Databricks are being open source. There will no longer be two different flavors. There will just be one Delta Lake as a true open source project that has all of that functionality inside it. So all of the file skipping, all of the Z ordering, all of the range data capture, all of the cloning ability, all those fancy super things that were just in Databricks open sourced into the true open source project, which is really, really cool for anyone not using Databricks, but interested in Delta. Uh, if you're on the Microsoft side of the fence using Synapse and you're looking at this, you kind of want to hope that they're going to implement Delta Lake 2.0 as soon as possible, because it's just a raft of changes that come along with it that we've seen for a while inside Databricks Delta. That's just great news for the open source community that all those changes are just being pumped into the major project. That is pretty big. Now there's the, the cynical part of you might think it's because of recent uh, altercations with Snowflake, where Snowflake was saying that Delta's not a true open source project because Databricks holds some of it back, but not anymore. Whether it's reactionary, whether it's part of the plan, whatever that actually looks like, it is very much now fully open sourced all of the different elements of Delta, which is very, very cool. Again, big, big news for the industry and actually great news for people who may use Delta in all sorts of different places, it's great news for just adoption because it means more people can hop on it. It can become the de facto standard of way of like structuring a lake, of using an advanced a lake, of building a lake house um, just because it's no longer held back. Great. Okay, other bits. There's some just straightforward GA announcements. So the, the announcement that Unity Catalog will be GA in the coming weeks. So it's not GA yet. GA in the coming weeks. We're expecting that announcement to drop very, very soon. But that is a strong statement to say, yeah, it's it's very soon. It's not like the end of the year. It's not in this coming quarter. It's in the coming weeks, we will see Unity Catalog uh, go GA. And on the same side, uh, I don't have a slide for it. We'll see the same for um, Delta Sharing. And Delta Sharing and Unity Catalog feel a little bit tied together uh, because Unity Catalog can be used as a Delta Sharing server, hence why the GA at the same time. So... Unity Catalog, I did a video of recently. There's loads more to show you on the Unity Catalog side. Uh, but yeah, great news that that's going GA soon. I'll be able to use it in anger. Because honestly, I mean, given it's all about security and governance and all those kind of things, I don't know many people who would use a governance tool when it was in preview because those the kind of people who use governance, governance tools want it to be robust and secure and production grade, which preview tools tend not to be. So yeah, great news that Unity Catalog and Delta Sharing are going GA. We'll see that very soon, hopefully. Now, interesting new features, new things that we hadn't really heard talked about before. Uh, one of these is a thing called Databricks Marketplace. Now, this feels very much powered by Delta Sharing. It's very much powered by the open data sharing protocol that we've been talking about recently that's going GA recently. But essentially, it's a way of selling data or sharing data um, powered inside Databricks. So you can go into a, you can go into your Databricks workspace, go, hmm, I need some data, shop around for various different example data sets and go, oh, that data set seems quite good. You can import a notebook that will allow you to work with a sample set of the data and go, oh, is this the right thing for me? What does that look like? Look at some sample charts, look at some sample dashboards built using that data. And then if you like it, go, yes, please, I'll buy that data. I'll buy that pre-built solution. I'll buy that thing. 
It's essentially a way of allowing companies to share their products, to essentially monetize their data products and share out different things that are uh, created and curated. So super interesting. I know lots of clients that we've spoken to have talked about wanting to productize their data and then have not really had a mechanism to try and do or gone out trying to find ways that they can actually set up shop to sell their data, which has unique insights, that has real value that they could drive from sharing that with the world. And it all uses Delta sharing. So essentially you say, yes, I would like to buy that when that's initialized. You then get a Delta sharing key that allows you to bring that data down locally and have access to it. And yeah, super interesting idea. Um, don't quite know how it's going to work fully. I don't know how the payment protocol works. I don't know if you can actually just pay directly through the market space or whether it's just a way of then going, great, here's the people's email. We'll put you in a queue. Not actually sure how that's going to work in anger. But again, it's a very early look at how these pieces will come together. And as an idea, super interesting. You can see on that, not just about data, but they've also said we can use that to share notebooks, ML models, solution accelerators, dashboards. So it's also things built on top of other bits. It might be someone sells a really good bit of data and someone else sells a really deep analysis notebook that sits on top of that bit of data and it all hangs together. It's just ways of working together and sharing each other's outputs. Loads of good stuff in there. Other thing that we had is Databricks clean rooms. Again, a completely different idea. Almost the, the opposite way around, where we've got two different companies, two different entities, and they both have one half of the puzzle. And what they want to do is run some kind of code, run some kind of analysis script that uses data from both sides, but neither side want each other to see the actual raw source data. So maybe if we had kind of a whole list of people's salaries and a whole people's list of HR grades, and we wanted to try and do some kind of matchup going, mm, is there a predictor of salary against HR thing? But I'm not going to tell all the finest things, the innermost HR details. I'm not going to tell HR the innermost salaries of everyone. I want to actually use these two data sets and I want to give it to essentially Databricks acting almost like a clean third party or demilitarized zone. You can send give access from both bits of um, data, but neither side is allowed to see the source data coming from the other side. You're allowed to run an approved piece of code. So one per side writes the code, shares it with us, say, is this script gonna be okay? They agree, they sign it off, they run it, and then they can see the output, but they can't see what went into it. And that's an interesting idea. So trying to actually build essentially a third party neutral neutral zone for processing data where neither side wants to share the full picture, that's what Databricks Clean Rooms looks to be. And interesting stuff. The data's not held there permanently. It's a one-off query that you then can't access any of the intermediary stuff. So if you're doing real secure data, that is data arbitration between third parties, they don't even need, need to be the same company because it's using Delta sharing. So you can actually set up protocols between entirely different companies, even in different cloud vendors because it's Delta sharing, which can go cross platform. Crazy, it's cool. That's Databricks Clean Rooms. So marketplace and clean rooms kind of almost two opposite sides of the idea. One saying, yeah, make data available to anybody. And then one saying, mm, no, tie my data down, both powered by Delta sharing, which again is going GA soon. It's like this whole ecosystem of different types of data sharing just bubbling up and becoming available because of this open protocol. Now we've got Photon. So Photon is going GA again. Very, very, it's either in the coming weeks or it's actually gone GA now. Now, we had seen Photon before in Databricks SQL side of things. Now, this is Photon going GA just generally because we've seen Photon available in the normal uh, data engineering, data science workspaces where you could flick Photon on and it would work, but it'll be a little note saying, this is preview, still preview, be careful. And now that's gone GA. So again, you can use Photon in anger and for most, most queries that is doing any kind of analytics, aggregations, joins, computation on your data, then you're going to see a performance uplift because of Photon. Now, you might look at that and go, mm, I don't get it. Why? why? Why is it better? Why is it faster than normal Spark? Uh, and if you want to know the down and dirty details, there is now the Photon white paper has been released. So there is a full in-depth white paper discussing what problems we're trying to solve, why they went around it, what they were hoping to do, and what are the key features inside Photon that have enabled them to speed it up quite so much. 
And yes, there will be a video coming soon, stepping through that white paper and talking about what it means. So, look forward to that. But yeah, main picture there, Photon GA is all good stuff. Final announcement from the day one. And again, there's loads more in day two, there's more to come. But big, big, big news is the public preview of Databricks SQL Serverless. Now, the battle for who can serve data out of a lake the fastest and the best and the cheapest has been raging for a little while, especially with Synapse Serverless, with Databricks SQL, these different offerings, and they each had different pros and cons. You have to leave a cluster turned on for that one. That one works, but it overreads data. It's a bit more expensive, or it depends on how much your users to use it. And there's all these different scenarios. Now, this just throws another tool in the Databricks camp saying, well, actually, what if you could use Databricks SQL, but it was serverless? So the first query may take a few seconds to start up, a few minutes. We don't really know yet. But then after that, you've just got this cluster that's sat there ready to respond. And following the same serverless principle, the same scale out on demand architectures that we've seen cropping up in a few tools coming into Databricks, they've announced it before as a thing that they were thinking about doing. Um, but now we've got a public preview available in AWS. And there was a, a timeline released as part of another follow-up session, which where we had um, Azure and GCP. Again, we should be seeing the public preview for both of those in the next month or two. And then a GA date or a planned GA day for all of SQL Serverless. It was looking like the end of this year. And I'll need to pull out the actual, um, the actual video to go through that. But it's an aggressive timeline to actually start having this Databricks SQL Serverless capability, and it's coming pretty soon. And that's my list. That is my list of stuff that was announced on the day one keynote. There's probably other bits in there that I have skimmed over just because there's so many big, big topics. We've got the whole Delta 2.0 is a massive thing for industry. And if you're using anything other than Databricks, you're suddenly going to see a load of really, really cool changes just suddenly crop up into the Delta libraries as you roll up to 2.0. It just lots, lots and lots and lots of things that are happening. Now again, loads of videos to do following up this stuff. We've got the day two announcements. Now in day two, we had things like Enzyme coming up. There's a load of ML flow announcements. There's workflows announcements. There's lots of other things that aren't just uh, machine learning sides. There's just peripheral tools, additional orchestration stuff, more engineering, Delta live tables, there's a load of additional things that we'll be talking about in the next video, which is all the day two announcements. So yeah, stay, stay tuned and I'll recap all of those things. And eventually we'll get to the end of this giant list of announcements. And then I'll be sat there with 20, 30 videos to make talking about each one of these things. So yeah, stay tuned. We've got, we've got lots to talk about. All right. So that is me for today. As always, do not forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you for the day two roundup. Cheers.